word did you use to complete the sentence? Other than your name, of course. If you listed more terms like these, you're more likely to have what is called an independent self-construal. If you listed more terms like these, you're more likely to have what is called an interdependent self-construal. Self-construal refers to how you define yourself. With independent self-construal, self-definition is thought to come from personal attributes, as the self is identified as separate from others. With interdependent self-construal, self-definition is thought to come from key relationships, roles, and group memberships, as the self is identified in relation to others. We're likely to see individuals with an independent self-construal in individualistic cultures who prioritize the individual over the entire group. Examples would include America or Canada, whereas individuals with an interdependent self-construal are generally part of collectivistic cultures who emphasize the needs and goals of the group as a whole over the needs and desires of each individual. This can be observed in the UAE and Southeast Asia. In short, there are patterns of thought associated with I versus we. This is Max, who has an independent self-construal. This is Sarah, who has an interdependent self-construal. They're going to help us demonstrate the difference between the two types of self-construal. Max likes family gatherings. She's always talking and laughing with everyone. Sarah, however, prefers being quiet and behaves shyly around relatives. Max stays consistent in her behavior by acting the same way with her friends. Sarah, on the other hand, grows talkative and animated around her peers. Alone, Max remains outgoing, browsing through social media and smiling at her phone. Sarah acts differently. She likes dancing and singing cheerfully. Max and Sarah exhibit different patterns of behavior depending on who they're with. With Max, her strive for consistency makes her better suited for standing out in a crowd. Because Sarah changes her behavior to fit her surroundings, she's great at fitting in with a group. Accordingly, the two self-constrolled are advantageous in different ways. The difference extends to their response towards their in-group and out-group members. The in-group is the community Max or Sarah share a similar context with and identify as a part of, like their friends or family, while the out-group is the rest of the world that they don't identify with, like strangers. The in-group out-group distinctions are pretty clear for Sarah, but not so much for Max. When a friend shows up late to her place, Max just assumes she's lazy. On the other hand, when a friend shows up late to her place, Sarah assumes her friend must have gotten stuck in traffic. Max's focus on the self makes her more likely to explain behavior by attributing it to personal characteristics. Sarah's focus on relationships and situation makes her more likely to explain behavior by attributing it to contextual variables. Note that the differences are not just psychological. In fact, different self-constrols can lead to different thinking. Activation happens in different regions of the brain depending on which type of self-control a person has. So where does that leave us? Let's see. Self-definition. Free from others. Tied to others. Priority. Self. Group. Self-consistency. Stable. Changes with context. Attribution. Person. Situation. In-group and out-group relationship. Fluid, distinct, relevant influence, in-group and out-group, in-group. But remember, nobody has 100% independent or interdependent self-control. After all, this isn't a definite divide and the real world is much more complex. In fact, we can take the divider off. By understanding the manifestation of these dominant self-constrols that make individualistic and collectivistic cultures so different, we get to understand each other better. Despite the differences, we can still get along. Thank you for watching!